And we're live. Five, four, three, two, one. Committee, Committee on Finance, Tuesday the 1st of June, 2021. Council Member Wyatt. Here. Council Member Bowman. Present. Council Member Nowakowski. Present. Council Member Vera. Present. Council President Pridgen. Here. Quorum is present. All right, from the top. Item number one, control our 2020 to 2021 third quarter gap response. Items open. Okay, this item's open and I see we have the deputy controller to speak on it. Uh, good morning, your honorable body. Um, yes, the controller filed her um, third quarter gap response um, as requested by the charter. A uh, quick overview of the response is that uh, the administration budgeted, uh, not budget, they forecast a uh, budgetary shortfall of 11.2 million. Uh, when we did our analysis, we we're showing a $17.6 million uh, budgetary uh, shortfall, uh, which gives us a difference between the two bodies of government of 6.4 million. Primarily, the difference is due to the administration forecasting the receipt of $11 million in tribal compact funds and we didn't record it on our end uh, due to the uncertainty of receiving the funds. And then also we're, sh we're showing a plus 6.3 million in uh, savings and um, appropriations, 6.3 higher uh, than uh, administration. We understand we, uh, we do our analysis uh, based off our uh, calculation projections and administration <coughs> same on their end. But for the most part, uh, it's probably been the first time in a long time that we came up kind of close uh, into uh, the two uh, analysis that's it. Okay. Any questions from anyone? Um, I'd like to go to the administration to respond. Good morning. Good morning. Jessica Brown here, I'm Director of Administration and Finance. Our third quarter gap shows a reduction in revenues by about $30 million, mostly due to COVID related revenues. And then also we're not showing the stimulus currently in the gap because um, we are basically going to use these American Rescue Plan funds to um, fill any deficit we have and end up with a balanced budget. So between the lots of revenues for COVID related um, revenues, such as parking, service charges, fines and penalties, permits, um, that's a that will bring us, and then we also received more state aid than we anticipated, as you know, of about $43 million. And our sales tax is higher than budgeted by about 14 million. For expenses, we, we're seeing a um, reduction in expenses from budget about $20 million, mostly due to vacancies, some reduction, reduction expenses, including utilities. And then also we saw a large savings in our fringe benefit for um, healthcare for retirees. So overall, we're projecting a deficit of about $11 million, which we intend to use some of the funds to fill that hole and end up with a balanced budget of zero at the end of the year. Okay, questions, colleagues? Okay, I just have some, some questions. You're saying that we got more than we anticipated from the state? Right. We had our reduction in state aid for the prior year that they restored. So we received okay. additional payments. Yeah. Okay. So basically they just gave us the portion that they had paused. It was not an additional amount above what we anticipated. Above what we budgeted. Okay. Um, and the inter intergovernmental difference from the controller to the per administration is the 11 million, correct? Correct. Okay. And why are we why are we using that number? Are we? I mean, we've been told over and over again that we're confident we're going to get it. We're we're confident we're going to get it. Correct. Um, we're still confident, and as you know, the we're right now the case is on appeal. We sh should hear something by the end of June about the um, the court's decision there. Okay, um, I, I'm concerned about the um, over the budget for the fire department um, is significantly over. And this is just a third quarter gap. Right, we projected, um, obviously they're over, mostly due to overtime about $4 million, which was related to COVID at the beginning of the year, 
there's several reasons. There was quite a few people out on administrative leave, about $1.7 million of overtime related to that. And then their new class was delayed about four months. Since their new class graduated, their overtime has actually reduced about a half a million dollars from the prior year when you look at all the um, paid periods since then. And then also for fire, although it's not related to overtime, it's related to their annual salary, they will see a reduction in revenues or reduction in expenses from the SAFER grant where they're receiving about $3.2 million to help with their annual salaries. So um, basically with the overtime for fire, we saw a lot at the beginning of the year, it was really front loaded and now it's improved. But because of that, the projection is higher than what we budgeted. So what is the, the, the difference between the previous, the second quarter gap and this one in fire? I think our projection was pretty close to what we budgeted, what we projected for our, the second quarter gap. Because at that point, our overtime was getting on track and improving. We had already seen the, the first quarter gap and what had been done there. So at the second quarter, we projected about the same ending fire amount of four, um, over $4 million. Now, Jessica, can you speak to, now you just said that fire was um, a lot of their overtime was uh, because of COVID. Can you clarify what you mean by that? Um, a, a large amount of the firefighters had to go on administrative leave for either thinking they had COVID or testing positive for COVID. I don't know the exact amount. Okay. It's more of a question for Commissioner Ronaldo. But okay. when someone's on administrative leave, then the person who fills their spot has to get paid overtime for that. Yeah. And as you know, firefighters, it's a very public facing occupation. So they were, had a lot of exposure and that's how they ended up with those cases happening. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm with that. Any other, any questions, colleagues? Council Member Rivera? You're on mute. Thank you very much. Uh, Jessica, you mentioned uh, we're talking about projections and you're, we're projecting to be a shortfall of, was it 11 million? Correct. Because okay. in, oh, go, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, that $11 million deficit um, is, and you plan to make that up. I mean, you're counting on the casino money um, as part of, to make up that shortfall? So the casino money is still included in our revenues. So the $11 million is essentially how much we think we're gonna to have to use of the American Rescue Plan funds in order to have a balanced budget this year. We didn't include it in revenues because our budgeted revenues for that amount was 65 million. It didn't really make sense to include it in the gap report anymore. Okay. Does that make sense? Any other questions, colleagues? The, the controller came up with a different number, 17 million. Um, are we underselling or over delivering and underselling? Because their number is 11, is about 6 million different. Um, and you're saying that we can use the American Rescue dollars for that. Um, that that's what everyone is telling us that those dollars can be used for this deficit. Right. I mean, the controller's difference is mostly due, besides the casino money, to um, personnel and other expenses. They're projecting about $6 million lower than us, which we just want to be conservative. There's a lot of year-end expenses that happen. So just based on prior experience and the idea of being conservative, that's where the difference comes in in expenses. And we're coming a little bit higher in expenses. Okay. Yeah, but the, the one thing we want to make sure we're dealing with the reality that we understand, because we because if we can't use the rescue money, I mean, we're saying we can. Um, last year we did a deficit bond um, and depending on how this goes, I mean, because at, at the end of the day, what I'm concerned about is that are we gonna do something that's gonna come back on us later that we use this money and it may not be used as we believe it should be, well, we believe it should be used one way, but it, it's still not clear <laughs> how, how we reconcile those that information because we're being told again that this is for loss of revenues from COVID. We've seen the numbers and the numbers that we see are nowhere near 12, 15, 17 million dollars. I mean, when you think about our sales tax revenue, that's pretty much on par. We took our sales tax revenue, that's on par. Um, the only things that we're dealing with is are the expenses from 
let's say if you say firefighters, um, but what other expenses that we do we have that are, oh, excuse me, and the revenues that we lost based on um, parking fines and those type of things were still doesn't come up to the 50 million or 60 million that we're anticipating using supposedly. Um, so to answer your question, I mean, we have all seen the guidelines at this point. The, it's actually not lost revenues due to COVID, it's just lost revenues. Um, in, in the guidelines, it gives you a formula that you use. So um, I, I think based on the formula and the guidelines, I'm based on that, the administration's opinion is that we can use the money for this. And I think the comptroller has also said that. So um, I'm not sure if maybe you could point out your concerns in the guidelines of where it wouldn't be allowed that I could. Yeah. Oh, well, I guess the point that you just made, you said they said they, they are not re revenues related to COVID. They just, we can use them because we just have a loss in funds. Correct. There's actually a formula in the guidelines that you calculate how much revenue you lost and that much is basically available for you to use for something like this. Okay. And just to speak to that, um, the controller and her team did analysis. And when you take a look at the legislation, it is allowable. I mean, we know what's allowable, what's not allowable. So it's not something where the city will, it will come back and haunt the city where we have to uh, pay the funds back. Uh, as uh, Jessica just stated, uh, within the guidelines, there's a formula and the calculation. And Bill, I don't know if you wanna add a little bit more in regards to um, the calculation or the, or the, uh, the allowable, what, what we can and can't do. Hi, it's uh, Bill Ferguson, city accountant. Um, we look through the interim final rule. It's a rather lengthy document, um, as you, as many of you have seen, but it, it does appear to be remarkably broad in its definitions, unlike previous um, federal guidance that came out. Um, usually, there's very specific criteria that they can use. Um, one of the terms that the feds are using in this rule right now is um, to ease the administrative burden. Um, they're allowing municipalities to take a very broad look at, um, look at revenue losses. And it's not surprisingly, it doesn't appear to be specifically COVID related. It's any sort of revenue loss. And they're looking at an average nationwide, which is, a, is a, I believe it's a 4.1 or a 4.3% annual growth and that's what they're instructing all municipalities to use this one average percentage. So each municipality doesn't have to go through and carve out specifically what, what, how COVID related impacted its own particular budget. They're using more of a nationwide average of 4.1% annually as, as a revenue loss. So Bill, will we be able to use part of that money for that 25 million that we have outstanding? Indirectly. <laughs> Okay. Well, that sounds like good news. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, when we looked at it, um, I'm <laughs> very, just part of my profession, very conservative by nature. And mm -hmm. we're looking at some of the numbers. I'm thinking, no, oh, this doesn't, I mean, without really reading through the um, interim final rule in detail, and I think this seems, this seems very broad and generous. And once we go through and look at uh, these specific sections, it is very broad and generous, surprisingly so. Well, Bill, that's so I, I, I was proved wrong. I mean, I'll, I'll admit when I was wrong. I'll be. And this is one time I'm happy that I was that I was wrong. CPAs are conservative by nature, right? Yes. <laughs> Goes any, with the territory. Any other questions, colleagues? Oh, Councilmember Nowakowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Jessica. So you're really from the standpoint of looking at those guidelines and into the future, uh, a lot of those funds are gonna be applicable to you know, many, I'm assuming, of our deficit notes and bonds. Is that correct? Correct, as um, Bill just pointed out, we'll, we have the deficit borrowing right now about 25 million, which can't be used, the funds can't be used directly for that, but we can use other sources of revenue for that and then um, fill our deficit with the funds. So in, like he said, indirectly, we can use it to pay off that debt. That's really the only um, debt that needs to be paid off at this time. Great, so it, re it really looks that, that these funds are um, at the right place at the right time. It can really set us, uh, you know, set us forward moving forward. Correct, yep. good news. Any other questions, colleagues? Okay, motion to table. Motion to table. 
Seconded by Councilmember Bowman. Item number two, third quarter gap, 2020 to 2021. Items open. Okay, this item is open. I think we basically covered that, right? Anyone want to talk any further? I think we're okay. Motion. Motion to table, seconded by Council President Pritchett. Item number three, public comment on recommended budget, fiscal year 22. Item's open. This item is open. Um, I didn't know, Council President, if you wanted to speak to this, um, I didn't know that you were pushing for public comments, and I think we did do that. Yeah, I'm, I'm Mr. Chair, I think we can receive and file this. I just wanted it to be a part of the record. Okay. Motion to receive and file. Motion to receive and file, seconded by Council Member Nowakowski. Item number four, response to council invite. Items open. This item is open. Council President, you want to speak to this or? No, I, I spoke to it in budget. Um, we, we know that they're not showing up to council, sending the reports late uh, for the record. And I, I, um, I, I really want to look at um, how we can end this um, control board situation um, early. Um, it is not impossible from what I'm being told, and it would obviously take uh, the state uh, to uh, end this. And I think that by next year, if we continue to have a control board that um, does not respond to the council on time, you know, and then sends um, a, a report uh, that basically uh, goes against the budget, well, in some ways at the last minute. Um, I think that their time is over. Uh, so I just wanted it to be on the record so that as we approach, if this council decides to approach um, our state legislature, uh, that we have the proof um, that they have very, very little help to this body. Thank you. And then I second that again, I mentioned during one of our conversations, uh, myself and Councilmember Bowman, I think really you are trying to champion a better relationship with the control board and I thought we were moving in that direction um, but some of this you know subsequent issues that have occurred since then it's just not seen like they really care too much about what we're doing and you know we, we I think we reiterated that we wanted a collaborative relationship it was not something that we didn't need them we really wanted their expertise because they do have very good expertise as far as the financial analysis and um, I think that for a while we, we hadn't had that relationship and we were hoping that that would happen. But unfortunately, since then, it doesn't seem like they're very receptive. So so this item can be um, received and filed. Motion to receive and file. Seconded by Council Member Nowakowski. Any further items? No further items. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Seconded by Council Member Bowman.